Logo, Indeed, One Search, All Jobs. At Indeed ENG, Monthly Tech Talks at Indeed's Austin Headquarters, Engineering.Indeed.com. Tom Bergman. Today's talk is on large-scale interactive analytics with Emotep. I'm Tom Bergman. I'm a product manager here at Indeed. And I worked on many of the tools that you'll see here in this talk. Uh, and with me is Zach Kokos, who's the manager of our marketing sciences team. And together, we help people get jobs. Website, Indeed homepage. Indeed is the largest job search site in the world. Uh, here's an example of our job search product. People can come, type in the type of job they're interested in and the location. Uh, and then we show them some results looking like this. Results for Indeed software engineer jobs in Austin, Texas. So today's talk is about Imhotep. So I figured I'd start off telling you what is Imhotep. Uh, Imhotep is a highly scalable analytics architecture for querying faceted data sets. Uh, and we're very happy to announce that coming very soon, it'll be our open source highly scalable analytics architecture for querying faceted data sets. Data, system, tools, people. Uh, so uh, as Kathan mentioned, in previous talks, we've talked about data, how we get all of the user data from all of our remote servers uh, brought back to a central cluster where we can use it for analysis. We've talked about the system, uh, Imhotep, which we use to build our decision trees and some of the engineering aspects behind how we use it for analytics. Uh, we've talked about how people can take the output of these tools and use them to make better decisions uh, about products. Uh, and today, we're going to talk about the tools that connect all of this, how, how the data gets to the people uh, to actually make things better. So uh, before I get to that, let me go over a brief history of how we've done analytics at Indeed. Uh, First off, uh, our general philosophy for everything we do here is what's best for the job seeker. Uh, in order to figure that out, uh, we need to test and measure everything. So we need this data to be able to make good decisions, and we need those decisions to help people get jobs. Uh, so what type of data do we use? We need good input to have good output. So the data that we use, for example, from our job search program is like this. Tom circles the what search box to the right of the Indeed logo at the upper left. We have a, we have a lot of information on this page. Uh, a query, for example, here it's Indeed Software Engineer. He circles the where search box at the top. We also have a location the job is at, uh, in this case, Austin. And then we have a bunch of jobs that we show on the screen. A different uh, block for each job description with a link on the top line. We call each one of these an impression, and there's a lot of information in each of these. So for every impression we show on Indeed, we log it. Uh, and we store the log information uh, in something that looks like this, log entry. Organic impression log entry. So here we have all the information about this impression. What was the title, the position, was it clicked or not, uh, what country was it in. Query, location, timestamp. Uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, so we take all these logs and we store them in log repo. Analytics on raw logs. And when we first started doing analytics at Indeed, we'd actually do analytics on these raw logs themselves. Uh, so we'd do netcat and grep to identify which logs matched our query, and then we could add up the metrics around them. Uh, now, this let us answer a lot of complicated problems, but it took a lot of effort for every single request that we made. And it, you know, there was a lot of, of load time. Eventually, we moved from doing this to uh, in the command line to doing this through Java, but it was still really slow and expensive. A Ramsey sample page. Uh, so the next big improvement we made in Analytics at Indeed was a program called Ramsey's. Uh, this was created by our CTO, Andrew Hudson, and it was named for his love of Egyptian culture and the fantastic amount of RAM that it used when we first made it in 2010. <laughs> uh, so Indeed's a search company, uh, and search is one of our, our core strengths. So of course, we approached analytics like a search problem. Uh, so what Ramsey's was, was at its heart, a search engine for logs. Uh, we'd build an inverted index out of all our logs. Uh, we'd search through them. We'd extract metrics from the matches. And then we'd graph those aggregated metrics. Uh, the way we'd get information out of it uh, was we'd put in a query and a metric we wanted. Uh, and then it would output aggregated metrics by bucket. So for example, let's say we wanted to know how many organic clicks we have in Australia. Query, country colon AU, metric, organic underscore clicks. So we'd put in the query, country Australia, and ask for the metric organic clicks. Uh, and it would return a result, something like this. A line chart. Uh, let's say we wanted to know what test group A or B has more revenue. Query, test group colon A, test group colon B, metric, revenue. Well, uh, we log every, uh, every test group on every page we show. So what we'll do is we'll put in the query test group A, test group B, and the metric revenue. It will find all the logs that have that test group, 
uh, and the revenue for them, and it will graph it like so. Line chart, does test group A or B have more revenue? We can also answer questions like, how has traffic from Yahoo changed over time in Great Britain, Germany, and Japan? Query, from colon Yahoo and country colon open parentheses GB, DE, JP closed parentheses. So likewise, we'll put in a query from Yahoo and country, uh, Great Britain, Germany, Japan, with the metric visits, and it can output a graph that looks like this. Line chart, how has traffic from Yahoo changed over time in Great Britain, Germany, and Japan? So we used Ramsey's extensively, uh, and actually exclusively, for two years to manage all our tests, all our monitoring. Um, and it was really good at doing a lot of things, but there were some things it just wasn't designed to do. Uh, for example, Ramsey's couldn't answer questions like, how many unique queries do we have in the US? Or what are the top 50 queries in the US? Or how many clicks did each of those queries receive? So in order to answer these questions, we built a new tool called Imhotep. Uh, and he is the guy on the far right there. Uh, so the origins of Imhotep uh, it began as a distributed iteration and group by engine for building our click prediction models. Uh, if you saw Andrew's talk a little while ago, uh, we build our click prediction models through a decision tree method. So we have a decision tree builder, uh, and it iterates uh, over each of the nodes level by level, building it breadth first, uh, like this. So it'll go through the first level, split into two groups, go through the second level, and so forth. Iteration numbers one, two, three, and four. Emotep origins. So we, we found that this was really, really useful for building decision trees. Um, but we also realized that we could then leverage this ability to do these massive group buys and aggregates to make a very powerful real-time analytics engine. So in addition to the very simple queries I mentioned earlier, it can also answer much more complicated queries. Uh, for example, how many Android app users with accounts older than 30 days saved at least one job in the past week? Or uh, what titles have the highest click-through rate for the query architecture in the US? What about the lowest click-through rate? Or for job seekers who click on Google Jobs in Ireland, what other companies' jobs did they click on? So we could write a program that could answer these questions for us. But what's really, really powerful about Imhotep is that we can answer all of these questions trivially uh, with a few clicks in a web app. And we don't have to do any sort of expensive ETL or, or anything like that. So here to talk to you about exactly how we do this, uh, is Zach Kokos. Text, I also help people get jobs. Zach Kokos, Manager, Marketing Science. Is this working? Cool. Uh, hey, I'm Zach Kokos. I manage the Marketing Sciences team here at Indeed, and I also help people get jobs. So uh, Marketing Sciences is a centralized research, analysis, and automation team, and uh, we support marketing initiatives. In order to do this, we use data pretty much extensively, or exclusively, and Emotep extensively. So I'd like to reiterate what Tom said and mention that we are open sourcing Emotep, and I'm super excited about this. Emotep is a highly scalable, soon to be open source, analytics architecture for querying faced data sets. And I'm excited about this for three main reasons and three main use cases that we have for Emotep. Emotep, at sign, indeed. The first is for ad hoc exploration. So if you don't know anything about your data set and you just want to take a look through it and kind of explore, Imhotep is great for that. The next is for specific analysis. So if you do know things about your data set and you have a specific query that you'd like to ask, you have a specific question, Imhotep allows you to do that as well. But it allows you to do it in a very, very fast manner. Finally, it's got an extensible infrastructure. So we're able to build tools on top of Imhotep to answer these questions and to automate these tools as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ad hoc exploration. And before I do so, I'm gonna go ahead and upload a data set to Imhotep live right now so that we can explore it shortly. Code. So uh, we see that in this directory I have crunchbase.tsv. So this is a file that I downloaded from Crunchbase's public website. Um, I'll show you real quick. It's, got, it's just tabular data. We have company permalink as a field. Uh, this is going to tell us where on Crunchbase the data actually lives, um, the company actually lives. We have the company name, category code, so just tabular data. I'm going to go ahead and upload this to Hadoop. So just copy from local, and I'm going to put it into a special directory inside of Hadoop that Imhotep knows to index. Ad hoc exploration, public Crunchbase dataset. A table has the header's company name, category, amount raised, and funding type. So I'll explain a little bit more about this data. As I mentioned, it's public data that we downloaded from Crunchbase's website. And here's an example of some rows. Now, each row in this data set is an investment that's occurred for a company. 
So we see at the top there, HomeAway, in the category of travel, raised a Series C plus round of funding for $250 million. Again, HomeAway, for $160 million, had a Series B stage of funding, and we see some other Austin companies there as well. Solar Winds, Retail Me Not Inc. Hello Volt. Now I should mention that these are not, the, the data set is not just Austin. It's got 48,000 investment events, and uh, we're going to look at some of the Austin companies though, just so it hits a little closer to home. He circles line one in the table home away. So henceforth I'm going to refer to these rows as actually documents, and we took this terminology from search, from, from search documents. He highlights company name, category, and funding type headers. Fields, or the, the columns in this data set, I'm just going to refer to them as fields, and that's the, the text categories that we have. He highlights the amount raised header. Fields, I'm going to refer to as metrics. So Imhotep treats metrics specially, um, which, is, which is why I should call this out. So we're going to look at this data inside of what's called Imhotep Data Explorer. And this is going to do um, you can think of Imhotep Data Explorer as an interactive tool for exploring Imhotep data, or uh, just a badass hyperlinked pivot table. <laughs> so uh, the hyperlinks I should mention uh, are on the fields and on the values. So when you click on a hyperlink on a field, it's going to do an interactive group by or a pivot on that field. And when you click on a value, it's going to do a filter. So uh, enough talk, let's go ahead and dive into Imhotep. A sample Imhotep page on the Indeed website. So, as I mentioned, uh, this is crunch-based data. Each document is an investment that's occurred for a company. And you see now on the left that I have funded year selected. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle off fields so we can look at these years. He clicks the fields button at the upper right. A new page with three columns appears with the headers number, funded year, 27, and count. In 2013, so we see the year 2013, and then over on the right we see count. On line one. This means that there are 9,000 737 documents with the value uh, with whose funded year was 2013. Or in other words, in 2013 there were 9,737 investments that were in this data set. Uh, we see 2012, 2011, and, and other years uh, as we scroll down. He clicks the fields button again to go back to the original page for funded year. So uh, we can also pivot very easily in Imhotep Data Explorer. So we can look at, for instance, company category code. He clicks on the company category code link in the first column and then clicks on the fields button. And we see that the top category with, uh, for rounds of investment is software. We then see biotech next, mobile with uh, just over 3,000 rounds of investment. So uh, very, easy, we, very easily we can use Imhotep Data Explorer to pivot on our data. He clicks on the fields button. Then he clicks on the company city link directly below company category code and clicks on the fields button again. I'm going to do uh, one more pivot on company city now. And we can look at the top cities that have raised rounds of investments in, uh, in the data set. So as you might expect, we see San Francisco on top, uh, then New York, London, Seattle, a couple more Bay Area cities. And then down there at number eight, with 772 investment rounds, we see Austin. So as I mentioned before, we can click on the, the, the values in this table in order to, to filter on this, these values. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Austin, and you see the interface change a little bit. Now up in the header, we have Company City of Austin. And what this has done is it's filtered our documents from the original 48,000 to just the 772 investments that are in Austin. So we can do something pretty cool here, which is uh, still pivot on this data. He clicks on the funded year link in the first column on the left. So I'll go back to funded year, which we were looking at initially, and look at just the funded years for companies that received investments in Austin. He clicks on the fields button. We see 2013 is still on top, 2012 after that. We see that 2010 and 2011 have in fact switched for, for Austin, which is um, interesting. To me at least. The count for 2010 was 119. The count for 2011 was 109. He clicks on the fields button. So, let's see what other fields we can pivot on. He clicks on the company category code link and then the fields button. A company category code was another one that we did before, so let's look at that. So, software was the top when we looked at the data set in its entirety, and it remains on top for Austin, but we see uh, enterprise is, is now in second, and biotech, mobile, clean tech, and so on. He clicks on the fields button. Now let's filter on, or let's pivot on one more field, which is the company name. So let's look at those companies in Austin that are receiving rounds of investment. He clicks on the company name link and then the fields button. 
Adometry tops the list here with nine distinct rounds of investment. We see uh, Uplogix with eight, Illumitex, KLD Energy Technologies, and uh, at number six we see Infochimps. So this has been cool. We've, we've filtered, we've pivoted, but um, I mentioned that metrics, uh, Imhotep sort of treats specially. So we can do something really impressive here, which is called Add Metric. He clicks on the Options button at the upper right of the screen and then the Add Metrics link just below the Options button. And what Add Metric does is it allows us to look at any other metrics that are in our data set and add those to the table below. He clicks on the top drop down menu next to Start Time. So I'm going to click on Raise Amount USD and add that as a metric. He clicks the Add button below the drop down menus. A new column is added on the right, raised amount USD. Now we can see, next to the amount of or next to the number of rounds of funding that were raised, we see the amount of funding in total that was raised. So for Adometry, over its nine rounds of funding, it's raised $44.6 million. Uplogix with $45 million, Illumitex, and so on. Now I'm going to go ahead and just click on raised amount USD, which will sort the data based on who's raised the most. We see now HomeAway is at the top, raising just over half a billion dollars in its five rounds of investment. Retail Me Not comes next, HelioVolt, SolarWinds, uh, some, definitely some popular Austin companies here. But Imhotep Data Explorer can go even further than that. We can actually apply math to the metrics that we add. So I'll go back to the options, click Add Metric, and select Raised Amount USD. He clicks on the second drop-down menu below Raised Amount USD and selects the forward slash. But I'm going to divide that by count. He clicks on the third drop-down menu and selects count open and closed parentheses. What this is going to do is it's going to give us the average amount that was raised per investment round for these companies. He clicks on the label metric link at the bottom right of the window. I'm going to actually label this metric average raise. AVG underscore raised. raised because raised amount USD divided by count is sort of verbose. He clicks the add button at the bottom. Average raised is now the right column. So uh, I'll add that metric, and we see now, uh, next to HomeAway over its five rounds of investment, there, it raised just over half a billion dollars, which was on average $100 million per round. Retail Me Not, on average, $59.9 million, and we see HelioVolt there with $42.1 million. And we don't quite round in Imhotep Data Explorer, but that'll be fixed by the time we open source it. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and sort by average raised. Uh, so we can see, on average, which companies are, have, have raised the most money. HomeAway is still on top here, but we see that SolarWinds has actually switched positions, and over its three rounds of funding, it raised $217 million, which averaged to $72.5 million per round. So this was really interesting, and, and we can very easily add metrics to our data set, but we can actually retain these metrics as we pivot to other fields. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle the fields back on, and pivot on company category code. He clicks on the company category code link and clicks the fields button. So before we saw that software was up at the top when we sorted based on count, um, we're still, now we're sorting based on average raised, and we see that travel on average raises 84 million per round. As you can imagine, uh, HomeAway might skew that just a little bit. Uh, clean tech is next. We see analytics on there, network hosting. Um, let's go ahead and sort um, just based on count again. Um, Right, this was software, enterprise, biotech, mobile, and then finally we can sort based on raised amount USD, and we see that software is at the top in terms of raising $1.1 billion, um, or having companies that raise in total $1.1 billion over this data set. Uh, we then see clean tech, biotech, enterprise, um, as I personally didn't expect from this data set. So, uh, so this was cool. I mean, we knew nothing about this data set when I uploaded it. And uh, now we can kind of explore the data and learn a lot more about it uh, interactively through Imhotep Data Explorer. But this data set is just 48,000 documents. That's pretty small in terms of Imhotep. And um, it is, at its core, a large-scale interactive analytics system, uh, tool. Sorry. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the total size of the data that we have Imhotep living on top of is 125 terabytes. The largest index that we have is our job search index, which is 30 terabytes, and this is over 48 billion documents. Now that's a million times the size of the data set that we were just dealing with, and Imhotep, you can interact with this data uh, very simply just like we did before. Now, we looked into some commercial data warehousing solutions that could handle this type of data, and they ranged anywhere from 
to the tune of $20 million. So I'd just like to take this moment to reiterate that we are open sourcing Imhotep. Zach goes back to the Indeed software engineer search results page. So let's go back to the job search that Tom showed you before. So this is a job search on our site for Indeed software engineer in Austin. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of things that we would want to log here and a lot of things that we would want to look at inside of Imhotep. He highlights the what search box at the top left to the right of the Indeed logo. The first might be the query. So what is the actual job search that somebody did on our site? He highlights the where search box to the right of the what search box. The next is the location. So where were the job seekers searching? And finally is impressions. So this is an organic impression. It's the first organic impression on the page. He highlights a search result block. Now an organic impression is just a job that was displayed uh, as the result of a search. Let's take a closer look at that impression. We see that it's for front-end software engineer for new product uh, it's at Indeed in Austin. And uh, for these impressions, we actually have an index that I'll show you shortly. Some things that we might want to look at in this index are firstly the title. So what were, what were the job titles of the impressions that our job seekers saw? He highlights the second line. The company information, so what companies showed up, and for in this case, indeed, with, it, with its 63 reviews and four and a half stars. He highlights the paragraph of text starting on the third line. The description, so what was the snippet of information that we showed the job seeker? He highlights the bottom left text. And finally, the job age, so how old was the were the jobs that we showed our job seekers? Now, we actually want to log a lot more than just this. Uh, this is just kind of a snippet of the types of, of the breadth of things that we log on a single organic impression. But I'll simplify that a little bit and just show you a basic organic impression document. So here, for that job that we just saw, uh, we see the title is front-end software engineer, the position of one, so that was the first ranked organic job that we had, whether it was clicked or not, and we didn't click on that job, so that'll be a zero. The country that we show this impression in, so the United States. The query that was searched, which led to that impression, so indeed software engineer the location of Austin, and a timestamp. Now, looking at just one impression uh, might not be something that we want to do on a regular basis. We actually want to aggregate this information over tons and tons of impressions. So we store this into what's called the Organic Impressions Index. Now, I'd like to show you the materialized view of this index in Imhotep Data Explorer. So here we have uh, the organic index selected from the 5th of December 2013 to the 10th of December 2013. And Indeed is an international company with over 50 websites in 26 different languages. So um, we've selected country of IE just so that we can look at um, an, an interesting case study for, for one particular country. So we see, I'll toggle options real quick. Uh, we'll see that for the country of IE, um, there ha it has a count of just over 3 million. What this means is that we show just about 3 million impressions to job seekers doing searches in Ireland. Let's pivot on some more fields and see what else we can find out. He clicks on the job language link in the left column. So first, something that's interesting is job language. So what were the languages of the jobs that we showed in Ireland? He clicks the fields button at the top right. We can see that there were 14 distinct languages um, for the jobs that we showed. So um, that really tells me that Ireland is, is an international country. There's a lot, of different, a lot of different job languages, a lot of different people searching um, in Ireland. He clicks the fields button again. Let's pivot on something else. How about job age? A link from the left column. So what were the age of the jobs that we showed? He clicks the fields button. We see that topping the list is, is jobs that were just one day old. And of the 3 million impressions, we showed 280,000 impressions for just one, jobs that, we've, we ag, or that, we, that were posted on our site within one day. Uh, we then see two days, three days, four days, and so on clicks the fields button to go back. We can also look at page. He clicks the page link in the left column. So this is going to tell us uh, what page people were on when they saw these impressions. So page one, for instance, had 1.3 million impressions of the 3 million. What this means is that over half of our impressions were shown to, you, to job seekers who paginated, who went on to pages two, three, four, etc. He clicks on the fields button to go back. Finally. I'd like to do one more filter on, sorry, one more pivot on clicked. A link in the left column and then clicks fields. Now clicked, as I mentioned, is going to tell us whether or not a job seeker clicked on an impression. So we see here that 106,000 times of the 3 million impressions that we showed, job seekers actually clicked on the jobs. 
So this is a great way of measuring job seeker engagement. So if somebody is interested in a job, if they want to learn more, they're likely going to click on it, right? He clicks on the yes link on line two of the click table. So I'm going to go ahead and filter on clicked and just look at those impressions which received clicks, which again is 106,000. We can now pivot on any of the fields that we have in this index and see for those impressions that were clicked, what are the values for those fields? Let's go ahead and pivot on company first and look at which companies received the most clicks. He scrolls way down the page to click on the company link in the left column and clicks the fields button. Man, we have a lot of, a lot of fields in this index. So uh, I'll go ahead and we see that, um, we see CPL Jobs, that's a, a huge recru recruitment agency in, in Ireland. Uh, we see Tesco, which is a, which is a large grocery re retailer in, in Ireland. And uh, down there at number seven with 717 clicks is a company that we should all be familiar with, Google. So uh, let's dive in and explore some of, some of or the people who clicked on Google. He clicks on the Google 5400 link. So I filtered by Google and now from, uh, from the three million impressions that we had in Ireland, uh, we took 106,000 of those that got clicks and now 717 of them is what we're currently looking at for the company of Google. Let's look at the jobs that Google posted and see if we can find anything interesting. So I'll scroll down and click on title. And he clicks the fields button. So we see that at the top is administrative assistant in sales with 99 clicks. Now this makes sense because Google has a massive sales operation in Dublin. We also see a uh, university program specialist, business intelligence analyst, and down there at number seven, software engineer, PhD university graduate with 19 clicks. Now, I know there are some software engineers in the audience, so let's go ahead and filter on software engineer and, and check out this job. So from the initial set of documents that we had, we're now looking at just 19, and just those 19 documents that received clicks um, for this title of PhD software engineer, university graduate that Google posted. So we can do something super cool here, which is perform yet another pivot but we're actually gonna pivot on query now. The first link in the left column. What this is gonna do is it's gonna tell us for the clicks that were made on this job, what were the initial searches that led to those clicks? So we see machine learning, software developer, we see Java developer, graduate Java. So I just wanna take a second and pause and, and kind of talk about how cool this is. I mean, we took from three million impressions, we went down to just 19 of those that got clicks and then we were able to say, oh, well, we were able to do just one pivot with one click and say, what were the queries that led to those impressions? Now, Imotype Data Explorer just made this super, super easy. But I wanna pivot on just one more field here, which is called CTK, or Cookie Tracking Key. This is a unique anonymous cookie that we give to our job seekers when they do a job search on our site. And it allows us to track them over time and see what, the, what else they've done. He clicks on the fields button. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up fields again, and scroll down to CTK. CTK is far down the list in the left column. Get there eventually. He clicks CTK and the fields button. And look at the distinct cookies or the distinct job seekers who perform these clicks. And we see that there are 19 distinct job seekers who were clicking on these jobs. Now that's interesting, but Imhotep Data Explorer impresses us yet again and allows us and gives us a functionality called filter all. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this button. He clicks the filter all button on the top left. And what it's gonna do is what's called a CTK query. Uh, so this basically just took those 19 individual CTKs and it applied them as a filter to this data set. So we now have the CTK query for country IE, clicked yes, company Google, and title of software engineer, PhD university graduate. So now we can do something kind of cool we can actually remove the other filters that we've applied and just get those job seekers that we're interested in. So I'm gonna click X on Google. The red X. And I'm actually gonna click this little minus button next to this title. What that's gonna do is it's gonna negate the title for me. So now I'm looking at just impressions that were clicked on by these job seekers in Ireland, but where the click was not that particular software engineer title. So this is gonna tell us every other click that these job seekers did. He clicks query, the top link in the list. So let's go ahead and first pivot on query. So what queries did these job seekers do that led to their other clicks? He clicks the fields button. We can see graduate, um, we saw that before. Uh, received, there were 25 clicks when people searched graduate. 
.NET developer, Java developer, embedded, SQL. So that's some pretty interesting information. Um, let's, let's pivot on some other fields. He clicks the fields button. We can move down to title and see what other titles these job seekers clicked on besides that, that Google software engineer one. He scrolls down the left column list and clicks on the title link. We see that there were 100 distinct other titles that they clicked on. Uh, with four clicks out of this, from this group of people, we see job dash software engineer graduate Dublin. We see software developer for a trading team. We see EY, which stands for Ernst & Young. Uh, software developer, Java developer, so lots of developer jobs as one might expect. Finally, I'm going to pivot back on company. He clicks the fields button to go back. So what this is going to tell us is what other companies these job seekers were interested in. He clicks on the company link and clicks fields. So we see at the top with six clicks, software placement. Also, IBM with six clicks. We see Deloitte. Full tilt, full tilt poker, and we see Google down there as well with three more clicks. So what that means is that these job seekers actually found another Google job and clicked on that three times. So again, I want to pause here and just talk about this. So we have these 19 distinct job seekers that we were able to filter on, and then we were able to basically do build a, a click co-occurrence model right in front of, like, just by pointing and clicking. So normally these types of things are reserved for data scientists or you know, people with math backgrounds who want to program this type of stuff. But we could just do this in a matter of like five clicks. So Imhotep Data Explorer, needless to say, is a super powerful tool, which is why we're super excited to open source it and to talk about it today. But there were some things that we weren't able to do with Imhotep Data Explorer. For instance, it can't combine results from multiple data sets. So we use the crunch-based data initially. We use the organic impressions data next. But if we wanted to say, look at the companies receiving the most clicks who raised a particular amount of money by joining these two data sets, we couldn't do that. It also doesn't allow us to easily automate things. So it is a front-end web app, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to, to automate things just based on that. Uh, and it doesn't really give us hooks into the data itself. Because of this, we created Imhotep Query Language, or IQL. IQL does allow us to do these things. We can combine results from multiple data sets, and it allows for the easy automation of tools, which uh, my team has done regularly. So let's talk a little bit more about IQL. There are three requirements to an IQL query. An index, so where you want to get the data from, a date range, so when you want to get the data from, and metrics. And I mentioned before, metrics are just numeric valued fields, so what type of numbers you want to select from this data. We also have two optional fields that we have. Um, filters, so do you want to filter your data? For instance, we filtered before on country of Ireland and clicked being yes. And group by, so what groups do you want to see in this data? And before, we were, when we were looking through Imhotep Data Explorer, we were basically just doing interactive group buys when we selected those fields on the left. So for instance, when we clicked on company, um, when we clicked on company it did a group buy for us and gave us a gr all the groups of companies that were there. Zach highlights the first line. So this is what an IQL query looks like. First, we select count. So select the metrics that you'd like. Uh, count is a special metric, which counts the number of documents in the data set. Highlight second line. We then take the index, so from organic. So where are we going to get this data from? Organic is the organic impressions index. Highlights the third and fourth lines. We then have a date range, so December 5th, 2013 through December 10th, 2013. Highlights the fifth and sixth lines. We've got filters, so where country is Ireland and clicked equals one. Highlights the seventh line. And finally the groups, so grouping by company ID. Now this is basically just going to give us the first grouping, the first pivot that we did uh, in the organic data set where we looked at the companies who received clicks in Ireland. So with IQL, we can now answer some really cool questions. Questions like, do companies that have raised more than $10 million in Austin get more clicks on average than those that have raised less than $10 million? So to answer this question, uh, we kind of have three steps. The first is go to the organic index, select companies in the US, that received organic clicks. We can then go to the Crunchbase index, select companies and the amount of funding for these companies who received investments in Austin. And finally, we can just join these two up, segment based on that 10 million number, and, uh, and do the math. So let's go ahead and do this. We're actually going to do this using uh, what's called ISH. And ISH is an interactive IQL interpreter. 
that, uh, that we built on top of Python. Now this pulls in the, the pandas, uh, pandas library in Python, which is a great numerical analysis and kind of just data analysis library. So the syntax is gonna be all, is gonna be mostly pandas. So the first thing we wanna do, as I mentioned, is just say clicks is select count from organic. Uh, we're gonna do this over the past seven days, so from seven days ago to today, where country is US and clicks is one, and then we're gonna go ahead and group by company ID. He presses enter. So I'll run that. Results with two columns, company ID and count. And uh, we see it very quickly spits out an answer. Um, we're assigning this to the variable of clicks, and we see that right now it's sorted on company ID, but for every company ID, we have a count, and this is the number of clicks that that company has received. We can then, in another variable called company funding, say select raised amount USD, so the amount that was raised in US dollars, from Crunchbase, from over the, the date range that we have this data set, where company city is Austin, and we're gonna group by company ID so that we can do the join with the other data set, and company name so that we can associate a name with the data. He presses enter. Three columns of data appear. So again, we see it's very snappy, and we have company ID, company name, and raised amount USD. He types clear. Finally, uh, we can do a join. So I'm gonna assign to a variable called joined, the join of clicks.company ID, and we're gonna join that on company funding.company ID. Presses enter and he gets four columns of information. And now we have a data frame with all the data that we need. So we can now do the, the segmenting that I mentioned. So first, I'm gonna create a variable called less than 10 mil. And basically, I'll show you the syntax, is gonna be uh, joined where raised amount USD is less than $10 million. So we can go ahead and I'm gonna sort this based on clicks and, uh, and look at the top 10 values. Four columns with the headers company ID, count, company name, and raised amount USD. So we see that Favor, who raised just under a million dollars, has had 2,200 clicks over the past seven days. Indeed, we raised $5 million, uh, we had 1,200 clicks, and, and so on. So let's go ahead and do this for the companies that raised more than $10 million. Pulls up the query and presses enter. Four columns appear with the headers company ID, count, company name, and raised amount USD. So we see it was very easy to segment that data using pandas, and then I'll sort it and sort it based on clicks, and we see that at the top, Bizarre Voice received 1,000 clicks, uh, and they raised about 130 million in funding. We see Matt My Fitness, HomeAway, SolarWinds, and so on. So lastly, we just have to do a bit of math on this. So basically just find the average number of clicks in each of these, in each of these data sets and uh, see if there's a difference. So again, Pandas makes this very easy. We can simply say uh, less than 10 million, uh, look at that field of count and then do a describe. Mean, standard, minimum, 25%, 50%, 75%, max, D type. And this is gonna give us the five number summary. So the mean, median, standard deviation, deviation and so on. We see the mean here is 161 clicks, uh, and the median is 41 clicks. We can do the same thing for more than 10 million. And we see the mean here is 188 clicks, and the standard deviation, or, and the median is, is 64 clicks. So IQL allows us to very, very simply combine our data sets, and you can imagine it's very easy to automate tools off of this. Uh, now, I should mention this is clearly correlation and, and not causation, but it's uh, still some interesting analysis that we can do. Imhotep is, has been wonderful in, in the marketing department and we love using it, but uh, it's actually more, much more used than just us. So Tom's gonna come back up here and talk to you about the different people who are using Imhotep and uh, he's gonna walk you through a, a real world example that we had to solve using Imhotep. Tom Bergman, product manager. So uh, I'm Tom Bergman again uh, and I still help people get jobs. So uh, like Zach said, I uh, want to talk about a real world example of how we used Imhotep to improve the product here. Uh, before we get that, I just want to kind of go, go back and iterate through what we were talking about. So we call Imhotep our large scale interactive analytics platform. So when we say large scale, uh, we're talking about the, num the amount of information in it. So we have at Indeed 123 unique indexes. So these are all different data sets uh, that we have put in there. We have uh, the largest index of 30 terabytes, and the total size of the indexes altogether is about 125 terabytes. 
And we store this duplicated for redundancy, so the total, imp total, total footprint is about double that. When we say interactive, we're talking about speed. So when you ask a question, you get an answer back very quickly. IQL, which Zach was showing off, is largely programmatic access here at Indeed. And we get about 76,000 queries per day. Uh, and the average time to execute those is 0 0.67 seconds. Uh, so very, very fast, uh, very big volume. Uh, Ramses, which I showed earlier, uh, is still around. Uh, it's largely human, although the back end is now powered by Imhotep. Uh, so Ramses usage, uh, we get about 3,400 queries a day. Uh, and the average time to execute those is about 4.4 seconds. So still very, very fast for the amount of data we're talking about. Uh, the other thing about interactive is we have a lot of users. So at Indeed, we had uh, 198 users in the past month who used it. Uh, we did 25,622 unique queries uh, done by humans. Uh, and that was an average of 53 queries per user per day. Uh, so it's been able to, enable, to let all of us get at the data very quickly. Um, and because we can ask questions so fast, we can iterate through it, do different variations, ask a bunch of questions. We say it's an analytics platform. Uh, so it's not just a tool. We, we call it a platform because we can build a lot of tools off it. So like some of the things that Zach showed, we have uh, 40 internal clients that use it. Uh, so we have six analytics web apps, like uh, Imhotep Data Explorer or Ramsey's. Uh, we have five dashboards that pull data from it and display it uh, all day long. We have 10 programming or scripting shells, like uh, Ish. Uh, we have a R one. We have a Python one. We have six monitoring apps that check performance of our production software using it, uh, and more. What's really, really powerful for this, uh, about this for us as an analytics platform is that it gets one tool set for all the data. So we can put in data about our website usage, uh, operational monitoring, like from Nagios, uh, financial reporting, Google Analytics, internal web app usage, and external reports. And we can put this all together in one place uh, and use it to solve some real world problems. Uh, so going into that, um, our job indeed is to provide the best results. Uh, and that means we're going to show jobs to users that are most interesting to them. Uh, like Zach said earlier, clicks are a very good indicator of interest. So uh, more clicks, generally more relevant, less clicks, less relevant. Um, for one user, uh, they'll click if they like it. And for a bunch of users, we can judge how, how valuable it is to use this as a whole. Architecture. Uh, so one particularly hard query we've had to deal with is architecture. Um, one of the reasons that it's very hard to deal with uh, is that most of the architecture terminology has been co-opted by technology. Uh, so for example, there's a lot of words that are common to both of them, which makes it very hard to, to figure out which is which. Uh, blueprint, design, infrastructure, modeling. Uh, architects even have to do code reviews. Uh, they're a little bit different, but. Also, framework, engineer, project manager, development, technical architect, software, and computation. And here's some of the different titles we'd see. So for example, an architect who works on buildings might have a title like architect, or CAD designer, or project manager. Uh, whereas one who works in software might have a title like software architect, or UI designer, or project manager. Um, so it's been very hard for us to figure out how do we get the best results to users when there's so much crossover between these. And one of the ways we've done that is using Imhotep. So I'm going to go back to that uh, organic index uh, that Zach showed. Uh, and now I have it filtered to queries for architecture uh, in the US uh, over about a month. So this is maybe three or four times the data that uh, Zach was looking at. So we have here, what are the titles that people who search for architecture saw in Indeed sorted by volume? So if they do a query, uh, the top one was project manager, followed by architect, architectural intern, et cetera. Project architect. So this tells us what jobs showed up, but it doesn't really tell us how users reacted to them. So in order to get that, I'm going to go in and add another metric here. He clicks on the Options button at the upper right and clicks on Add Metric below it. And the metric I'm going to add is going to be CTR. Uh, so that's, uh, we call it click-through rate. It's going to be clicks, uh, whether or not the user clicked on it, divided by count, which is going to be the number of times we showed it to people. He chooses from three drop-down menus. The first one is clicked, second one is forward slash, third one is count. He clicks the checkbox in front of percentage and clicks on label metric and types CTR. This, is, this click through rate is going to be the, uh, the average chance that someone clicked on it when we showed it to them. 
He clicks the Add button at the bottom and then clicks the Fields button at the top left. So we'll hide that. Um, and this is going to load up uh, in a little bit. And we'll see in that time period, what were the chances that someone clicked on the job with that title when it was shown to them? Title, 28,852. So you'll see uh, Project Manager uh, had a CTR of 5.3%. So when people saw that job, there was a 5.3% chance they clicked on it. Likewise, Architect and so on. Uh, so what we can do that's interesting is figure out what were the most interesting titles to people during this time period. And we can do that simply by sorting uh, by CTR. He clicks on CTR, the header over the third column on the right. The black arrow points down. So now we'll see uh, at the very top, uh, the highest CTR title was Architect with 0 to 3 years experience with 17% CTR. Uh, so there's a 70% chance that people clicked on it. Uh, followed by Designer 1 Architecture, Architecture Intern, Architectural Drafter, a Design Professor, etc., etc. New Graduate, Architecture, Architect Intern, Architectural Project Manager. So with this, uh, we can tell these titles are all about making buildings. People obviously can tell by the title and they click on it so they're interested. Uh, likewise, we can sort it the other way and see jobs that had the lowest CTR. He clicks on CTR again and the black arrow points up. So we'll see WebSphere Operation Decision Management, uh, Web Developer, Java Architect, Systems Engineer 2. What you'll notice, uh, it's very different about these, is they all have a CTR of zero. Uh, so there was not a single time that someone searching for architecture clicked on these jobs when it was presented to them. Um, of course, these, these volumes are very low. You see we have 28,000 titles during this period. Um, so maybe there were other titles that had, uh, you know, in the long tail that we can't see here in the results. Um, but we can actually do a little bit something to address that. We have a field called title words. Uh, what that is, oh, field. he clicks on fields. So we, uh, we take the title, we tokenize it, so we break it down into its component words, and then we index all three of those words for each document. He scrolls down. Uh, and then we can basically say, did a document or did a job have this word in the title? He scrolls down for a while and clicks on the link title words better in the left column and clicks on fields. So when this loads up, it's going to show us what are the top words that occurred in any of the titles for the query architecture in the US during this time period. Header, uh, title words, better, 8,545. So we'll see top word was architect, not surprising, uh, followed by manager, project, engineer, intern, etc. We can, then, uh, we can then sort these words by CTR and see what is the correlation between the words in the title and whether or not it's clicked on. He clicks on CTR and the black arrow points down. So we'll see again uh, at the top, architectural, drafter, CAD, uh, followed by entry, intern, junior, uh, and then architecture, summer, planning. Uh, so these are mostly, mostly words uh, relating to architecture buildings. We also see a lot of kind of entry level things, and this is largely a seasonality thing. Uh, so around the beginning of the year, lots of people start looking for entry level jobs as they're getting ready to get out of school. He clicks on CTR and the black arrow points up. Let's go sort the other way. So now we'll see the lowest uh, CTR words for people searching for architecture. And we'll see, you know, very, very stark again. Assurance, network, Java, software, Oracle, intelligence, programmer. So all very technology related words. So now that we figured this out, what do we do? Um, so this method of segmenting by a field, doing a group by, and then looking at how it changes the metrics is one of the ways that our CTR model works. So we actually will try to find the biggest splits and choose things by that. CTR model is going to be affect ranking, not necessarily matching. Uh, so in order to deal with matching, uh, we use something called query management. So we use uh, Emotep to improve matching. Uh, through query management. The way we do that is first we started looking at things manually and identified words that shouldn't show up, uh, words, jobs, etc., that shouldn't show up in the matches. Uh, so then we can actually have automatic programs going through IQL uh, to determine, or going through MOTEP, to determine which results should be added or should be removed from queries uh, and, and do that automatically. So as a result of this, uh, We've actually added 26,790 rules across all the countries uh, based on some of these patterns that we originally found through humans in Emotep and then eventually automated. Um, so that's you know, one example of how we use this to make our search results better for our users. Um, I thought it was pretty cool.
Emotep Open Source ETA, August 1st, 2014. So at this point, I want to close it and just say uh, Emotep is going to be open source. Uh, we're working very hard to get this done as quickly as possible. We're shooting for an August 1st, 2014 ETA. And I think Darren is upstairs right now working hard on getting this done. Um, and Vlad is here in the audience not working hard for some reason. <laughs> Emotep open source. So uh, we have data online, so please follow along at the blog, which is engineering.indeed.com. Uh, and you can see all the answers there, uh, all the updates, rather. We also have a mailing list, uh, and you can get all the updates sent to you directly. It's go.indeed.com slash emotep announce. Emotep hyphen announce. <laughs> Members of the audience wear name tags, sit on chairs, and clap. Logo, Indeed, one search, all jobs.